Good morning. I am the chair of the Committee on Governmental Operations, Council Member Fernando Cabrera. Today we are meeting jointly with the Committee on Land Use, chaired by my colleague, Council Member Rafael Salamanca, for an oversight hearing on the general operations of the Board of Standards and Appeals and the specific topic of zoning lot, lot mer mergers. The land use process in the city is complex. It can be incredibly opaque even for seasoned developers and city planning experts, let alone for the average New Yorker. Several city agencies have a role in zoning and city planning, including the Department of Buildings, the Department of City Planning, and the Board of Standards and Appeals. Over the years, the council has passed legislation to make the process more transparent to the public, more efficiently coordinated. Such legislations include requiring, excuse me, requiring notices of expiration of zoning variances and special permits to be shared with community boards, requiring the BSA to respond to community and borough boards when a determination is made contrary to the re recommendations, requiring biannual reporting on applications for variances and special permits and online mapping of variances and permits. Today, the committees expect to hear updates from the Board of Standards and Appeals on the transparency legislation that has been enacted today, as well as general information about the Board's operation, including the protocols around Board members' recusal and the administration of oath. Of particular interest is the role the Board, the board plays in the decisions that impact zoning lot mergers and the ways in which the board engages with DCP and DOB on these matters. Zoning lots are often made up of one or more tax lots. Under the zoning resolution, property owners can agree to, mergers, to merge their zoning lots. This allows owners to shift on use develop, development rights within the resulting merge zoning lot from one tax lot to another. The zoning resolution provides that property owners must record in the city register declarations of restrictions against each affected tax law participating in a zoning lot merger. This declaration must describe the entire tract of land covered by the zoning lot. However, there is currently no publicly accessible map of zoning lots and no centralized system to identify and track zoning lot mergers. As a result, it is nearly impossible for key stakeholders and members of the public to understand the development rights a developer has accumulated when a new building is erected that may be out of scale from the surrounding neighborhood. I think we will, be, we will hear testimony later today about particular towers, including the one of, at 200 Amsterdam Avenue and my colleagues Councilmember Rosenthal's district that have perplexed and anger community members. Their construction was enabled by an unusual piecing together of tax laws and partial tax laws that lead them to be seemingly out of character with the surrounding neighborhood. Because Sony lots mergers are, de are deals struck between developers and development rights are transferring Sony lot mergers as of right, there's currently no discretionary review from the city. Councilmember Rosenthal regrets being unable to attend this hearing. She led an effort to oppose the 200 Amsterdam Avion development, including having 26 of our council members signs onto a letter urging the BSA to prohibit the so-called gerrymander zoning, writing that the BSA decision will have implications fell citywide. I hope that would improve transparency, the land use process as it relates to zoning lot mergers can also be better understood by key stakeholders, including members of the general public. The committee will be conducting a first hearing on a package of bills. I will let Chair Salamanca speak to the bill before his committee. The Committee on Governmental Operations will be considering the following three bills for the first time. Introduction 1691, sponsored by myself, will require the Department of City Planning to assign a unique identifying number to each zoning lot in the city. The bill will also require that any subdivision or zoning lot merger will 
be reflected in the newly created zoning lot number. This bill will take effect immediately. Introduction 1692, sponsored by myself, will require the Department of City Planning to make the uniquely identifying zoning lots available to the public on an online map. The bill will require the zoning lot changes be updated on the online map on a quarterly basis. The bill authorizes DCP to receive all necessary information from the Department of Building, the Board of Standards and Appeals, and the City Register as needed for the implementation of this bill. This bill will take effect one year after it becomes law. Introduction 1723, sponsored by Councilmember Kalos, will expand local law 103 of 2017 to require the property owners testify under oath at all BC, uh, BSA hearing. The law currently only covers testimony by property owners at a hearing for variances and or special permit. I will let the sponsor of this uh, speak a greater length about this bill later on. I will also thank our staff uh, whose work made this hearing possible, Dan Daniel Collins, Elizabeth Cronk, Emily Forjohn, as well as my own legislator and communications director, Claire McLevin. And with that, I pass it to my co-chair, Rafael Salamanca. Thank you, uh, Chair Cabrera. Good morning and welcome to the joint hearing of the Committees on Land Use and Government Operations. I am Councilmember Rafael Salamanca. I am the chair of the Land Use Committee. And I would like to welcome our esteemed colleagues who are here today. We have Councilmembers Mizell, Powers, Perkins, uh, Rivera, uh, Gredenchik, Chair Adams, uh, Ku, and Councilmember Kalos. I would like to thank Chair Cabrera for his leadership of the Government Operations Committee and for working with the Land Use Divisions to bring greater transparency to the issue of zoning, lot mergers, and transferable development rights. Since New York City adopted the first zoning resolution in 1916, we have been an as-of-right jurisdiction. That means that so long as a proposed development complies with the existing zoning regulations, the approval of its building permits is not conditioned on discretionary approvals or public review. In the 103 years since the adoption of that zoning resolution, the city has become subject to an even more complicated array of federal, state, and local land use regulations. This fact, along with the complexity of the city's own zoning resolution makes it challenging for anyone, even professionals, to look at a vacant parcel of land and predict what can be built on it. One of the biggest challenges for forecasting future development is that zoning regulations apply to zoning lots. Zoning lots cannot be seen with the naked eye. They may or may not be continuous with tax lots, which are assigned by the Department of Finance for taxation purposes. While every building permit must be accompanied by a zoning lot description and a map indicating the boundaries of the zoning lot, there is no single map that shows where one zoning lot is relative to another. A vacant tax lot may be a zoning lot unto itself with a maximum developable height and bulk that can be calculated based on its square footage. The same parcel may also be part of a zoning lot that includes multiple tax lots. In which, in which case it might be undevelopable because its development rights have been transferred to another tax lot within the zoning lot. The lack of transparency is complicated by the fact that transfers of development rights within and between zoning lots are accomplished by contract between private parties. While record of such transactions must be recorded with the city register, there is no way to track development rights transfers without keeping a vigilant watch over the city's tax record. I would like to thank Chair Cabrera and Councilmember Kalos for bringing these issues to the forefront with this package of legislation that will finally require zoning lots to be mapped and numbered, just like tax lots, and also require the Department of Finance to notify community boards and elected officials whenever development rights transfers or zoning lots mergers are recorded. Hopefully, we'll be able to make the land use process more transparent and increase the public trust in our effort to build a city of the future that works for all New Yorkers. And with that, I'm going to allow uh, Councilmember Kalos to give an opening statement. Thank you to Chairs Cabrera and Salamanca. I'm Councilmember Ben Kalos, you can tweet me at Ben Kalos if you're watching at home and want to 
comments on today's proceedings. Today we're hearing two bills that I'm proud to sponsor. First, communities seeking to fight back against living in the shadow of a super tall building for billionaires seeking better views will get a new weapon in the form of public notice provided when real estate developers transfer, de transfer develop rights under proposed introduction 1701 of 2019. This bill would require that any time a transfer of development rights is recorded with the city that a copy be provided within five days to the relevant community board, council member, and borough president along with the speaker of the city council. While New York City is no longer a stranger to tall buildings since the birth of Billionaires Row on 432 Park Avenue, developers have been using the transfer of development rights to stack all the development rights onto a very small lot seeking to build narrow, super tall buildings in excess of, uh, I believe the definition is 800 or so feet. Now development of out of context skyscrapers and super talls are being proposed for residential neighborhoods at 58 Sutton, 180 East 88th Street, 249 East 62nd Street, 50 West 66th Street, and 200 Amsterdam Avenue, and all of which have faced fierce community challenge. Residents involved in the transfer often do not know they are helping bring a super tall to their community. As reported by the Daily News at Sutton Place, the developer got the residents to sell their air rights by misleading them into believing the building would be no more than 30 stories. Then before the ink was even dry, the developer turned around and announced plans for a $1 billion, 90-story mega tower, one of the largest condos in the country. Community challenges are often a race to the clock, making public notice essential. I want to thank my co-prime sponsor, Helen Rosenthal, and Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. I'd also like to thank the Land Use uh, Division staff, uh, Jeff Campagna and Julie Lubin, for their work on this bill. I also want to just take a moment to speak in favor of Councilmember Cabrera's uh, legislation, Introduction 1691 and 1692. You have no idea how many hours I have spent of my life going through ACRIS filings in order to determine which pieces of property developers owned, what LLC owned which piece of what, the relationship between multiple similarly named LLCs, uh, only to find that in the Definition of the zoning lot that was in their red herring and offering plan often didn't even match what was filed with the city at the DOB, let alone match what was filed with the finance department. And so I've been the one trying to actually piece together the actual maps, the DOB maps, and uh, others. And I was helped in doing all of that with, by a resident of my district named George James. But the fact is that that is crazy. No one should need to hire a lawyer and an urban planner to figure out what's going on. So I am incredibly supportive of 1691 and 1692. I wish to associate myself with both bills. In 2017, I sponsored in the City Council passed Local Law <coughs> 103 of 2017, amending the charter to provide that certain testimony delivered at a public hearing must be sworn or affirmed under oath. <coughs> Specifically, only testimony by an applicant on proposed application to either vary the zoning resolution or for a special permit shall be sworn or formed under oath. Local Law 103 also establishes a civil penalty for any person knowingly makes or allows to be made false statements to the BSA. Notwithstanding Local 103, the BSA rules do not require any person who offers testimony to do so under oath. Rather, the rules require only that the person offering testimony must state his or her name, address within affected area, and or representative capacity. Today we will hear Introduction 1723, which expands upon Local Law 103 of 2017, amending Section 663 of the Charter to require that property owners providing testimony at all BSA hearings do so under oath. The purpose of this introduction is to prevent unscrupulous property owners from providing false information to the BSA, providing, uh, providing board commissioners with accurate information when evaluating an application. I'd like to thank the committee counsel, Daniel Collins, for his work on this bill, as well as Jess Baker and Laura Pupa for their work on this bill and this package of bills the council passed uh, to reform the BSA in 2017. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Councilmember Kalos. Um, we just also want to recognize that um, Councilmember Rosenthal uh, asked us to, to read this letter that she actually sent to the BSA on June 5th, 2018, which was signed by, I would say, close to 20 of my colleagues, including myself, on uh, 200 Amsterdam Avenue. Um, and just want to point out here in the letter, we urge the, we urge the Board of Standards and Appeals to prohibit the use of gerrymandered zoning lots in the city of New York. The use of gerrymandered lots has significant policy implications for the city. Most fundamentally, we are concerned that divorcing zoning lots from the tax lots on a block will make ensuring compliance with the zoning resolution dramatically more difficult. 
Rather than working from a set pool of building blocks, lots mergers could now include a nearly unlimited number of variations and without tax lot boundaries for reference. The Department of Buildings itself has come to recognize that the public trust is best served by prohibiting such gerrymandering. It is noted in, in the March 9th letter to the board that having zoning lot lines coincide with tax lot lines promote clarity and transparency. This particular proposal is, one, is in one council district, but the implications of the board's decision on the land use process will be felt citywide. The board should not reverse the Department of Buildings interpretation. Rather, we urge you to uphold it and ensure a clear and more transparent land use process going forward. Uh, so with that, I will hand it over to council to uh, to the uh, to the council, and we'll just swear in the agencies present. If you could raise your hand, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? She may begin. Oh, okay. So, do you want city planning or BSA to begin? However you like. All right, city planning. Um, good morning, Chair Cabrera, Chair Salamanca, and members of the Governmental Operations and Land Use Committees. My name is Susan Amron, and I am General Counsel at the Department of City Planning. I am joined by Frank Rushala, Director of the uh, Department of City Planning Zoning Division. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify in introduction numbers 1691, 1692, and 1701. We appreciate the City Council's interest in zoning lots and zoning lot mergers. The Department of City Planning, New York City's primary land use agency, is responsible for planning for the orderly growth and development of the City of New York. It administers the City Land Use Review Process, referred to as ULERP, conducts planning studies, and collects statistical and other data that serve as the basis for land use planning recommendations. Department of City Planning staff also aid the City Planning Commission in all matters under its jurisdiction. The City Planning Commission holds regular public hearings and votes on applications concerning use, development, and improvement of real property subject to city regulation. I want to start my testimony by discussing how zoning lots are formed to frame our comments on the proposed legislation. As you know, the zoning resolution governs land development through specific use and bulk regulations applicable largely to zoning lots. For example, as a general matter, Development rights are calculated based on the size of a zoning lot and the applicable zoning lot district's floor area ratio. At its simplest, a zoning lot is a tract of land, usually on one block, that is to be developed as a unit. Today, the zoning resolution defines zoning lot in four ways. The first definition is historical and effectively grandfathers any lot of record existing prior to 1961. The other three describe zoning lots formed through common ownership of contiguous lots at specific points in time or through private agreements among owners of contiguous lots. Regardless of how they are formed, zoning lots generally allow the floor area to be arranged anywhere on the zoning lot in any manner consistent with bulk regulations. New zoning lots are created without involvement of the City Planning Commission or the Department of City Planning. Indeed, the transaction among private parties that create new zoning lots are typically accomplished as of right. That is, without discretionary approval of any city agency. City agencies may not know of a private agreement to create a new zoning lot until the landowners want to do something that depends on the establishment of the zoning lot. For example, pulling a permit for a development or engaging in certain types of property transactions. In that situation, when the owner wants a tract of land to be recognized as a new zoning lot, the owner records a zoning lot declaration of restrictions. And when a developer wants to develop or enlarge on such a zoning lot, the developer submits required documentation to the Department of Buildings, all as required by the zoning resolution. But precisely when a new zoning lot is recorded is largely up to the developer. No development, however, that depends on a new zoning lot is possible until the developer uh, records the zoning lot. These public recordation requirements were added to the zoning resolution in 1977. Zoning lots formed before 1977 
may or may not be supported by re uh, readily available documentation. There is no comprehensive list of zoning lots for all zoned land in New York City. Sometimes identifying a zoning lot is straightforward. Other times it can require weeks or months of fact-intensive historical research by title insurance companies, lawyers, and other experts. Occasionally, the available evidence for pre-1970 zoning lots is not definitive. By conservative estimate, there are tens of thousands of lots in New York City for which an official zoning lot has never been established in the public record. These may be lots with buildings that predate zoning in 1960, 1916 or the introduction in 1938 of certificates of occupancy that list the meets and bounds of a, lot, of a relevant lot. Because determination of zoning lot status has legal force and can dramatically affect what an owner can do on a site, inquiries into zoning lot status must be thorough and accurate, and zoning lots must be determined on an individualized basis. Given the history of zoning lot creation, the lack of historical documentation, and the complicated and individualized nature of zoning lot determinations, the Department of City Planning believes it would not be possible to assign an identifying number to, create a comprehensive list of, or develop a map displaying zoning lots for all zoned land in New York City. With respect to introduction 1701, we generally support the council's desire to, being trans to bring transparency to the creation of new zoning lots and look forward to working with the council on this effort. One final point, Intro, introduction 19, 1691 seeks to amend uh, section 191 of the charter, which sets forth the powers of the director of city planning. Changes to the authority of the director of city planning are subject to referendum. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today, and city planning looks forward to continued dialogue with the council on these proposed legislations. Good morning, Chair Cabrera, Chair Salamanca, and members of the Governmental Operations and Land Use Committees. I am Marjorie Perlmutter, Chair of the New York City Board of Standards and Appeals. I have here present several members of my staff uh, for support, including uh, Kurt Steinhaus, who's our General Counsel, and Carlo Costanza, who's our Executive Director. I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. The Board of Standards and Appeals supports introduction number 1723, which would require sworn testimony for all applications before the board because the board already requires most applicants to provide sworn testimony at public hearings. So as a result, I would like to provide a brief background on the board and then take questions. Since 1916, the board has worked to administer zoning, building, and housing regulations in a fair and just manner to protect the city's interest in safeguarding the general welfare while balancing private property interests. In this role, the board has frequently been called a relief valve, a protector of the city's regulations from constitutional challenge and a guardian of the urban fabric. The board is an independent agency that consists of five full-time commissioners with select skill sets, including experience in architecture, urban planning, and engineering, and supported by a staff of 16 employees. Using their technical expertise and independent judgment, each commissioner scrutinizes every land use application with the utmost of care. Commissioners review frequently involves analyzing intricate construction documents, financial statements, testimony from other governmental agencies, and site conditions gleaned through, gleaned through visits to the properties and neighborhoods at issue. The board's staff of 16 employees currently manages 103 years of archives and 651 pending applications. Since 1998, the board has had approximately 14,000 applications filed an average of about 700 applications per year over the past two decades. Under the direction of the board's executive director and deputy director, these 700 applications are reviewed by three full-time project managers, one part-time project manager, and one environmental officer. Second, I would like to note the board's implementation of recent legislation, 
which we discussed at the Governmental Operations Committee hearing on February 25th, 2019, where we went into detail about each of those bills and how the board was implementing each. Um, as you know, in 2017, the City Council passed nine bills relating to the Board of Standards and Appeals and its operation, which were signed into law on May 30th, 2017. These bills address concerns relating to the Board's transparency, consideration of community comments, and the veracity of applicants' submissions and testimony. The Board has since undertaken a number of initiatives to ensure implementation of the specifics of those bills, as well as taken measures of its own to further promote transparency and community engagement. Last, as I mentioned, we support introduction number 1723. The board already requires applicants and their representatives to affirm their testimony under oath, live at hearings for all cases, except interpretive appeals, general city law and multiple dwelling law waivers, and vested rights cases. Since the board already requires applicants to be sworn in for these applications, we support intro number 1723, which expands the, hope, the scope of this requirement. I'm happy to take any questions and look forward to hearing ideas about improving the board's processes. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Thank you so much. And uh, I wanna ask if Mona Siegel is present from DOB? Uh, if you could, we, we're going to have a few questions, and let me ask Council to swear you in as well. If you could raise your hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for my colleagues. Uh, I'm going to reframe myself and I believe Council Member Salamanca as well at the beginning just to a couple of questions so we could get you right in. So if you have any questions, please uh, let Council know. Um, let me start and welcome every single one of you. Appreciate all the work uh, that you do. It's very detailed work. Sometimes uh, may, uh, people on the outside may not understand this. So I'm going to try to give it uh, some context. Uh, when, uh, whenever I ask a question. So let me start uh, in general. Regarding uh, geo-coded data provided by the BSA on special permits and variances, prior to the enactment of Local Law 105 in, in 2017, it was the Government Operations Committee understanding that geo-coded BSA data will be added as a layer to SOLA. Why was the decision made to make to place this data on a different online map on open data instead of SOLA? Uh, so I, do, I don't think actually the assumption was that it was going to be added to SOLA. It was going to be made available to the, the public was and, and mapped. So what, what we did was we geocoded it. It's mapped available on open data and available through links on our own website. And what I'm understanding is that um, Zola is created actually to guide um, potential app developers, property owners in the shape and how to shape their buildings, how to understand what the zoning regulations are with respect to their buildings so that they can know how to move forward in a design. And city planning itself doesn't even put its own special permits on Zola because that's not guiding a potential developer or a property owner on, on how to design the building. So Zola is probably not the right place for the BSA determinations. Whereas open data is a great location for all of that information because it can sweep and have access to all of the data that's available in New York City. So Do you happen to have data? How many people have gone to the open data to get information? I don't, we could get that for you. I also have with me who's really our IT expert or one of our two RT experts, Carla Costanza. He might know this answer, but I don't know because that's pretty deep in the weeds. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're going to have to throw you in as well. Okay. Keep raising your hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Good morning, Council. 
I'm sorry, can you just repeat the question? Uh, the question was, uh, do you happen to have data, how many people go to open data uh, f to get uh, this information that we were just talking about? Yes, so at the time that the legislation was implemented, we, we uh, provided on both the open data and the open map portal. Uh, all of our data with regards to applications filed since 1998 and uh, till the present, as was required. Um, we went beyond the legislation, uh, which only required variances and special permits. We opted to provide everything, both decided and currently active. At, we have approximately 9,700 applications available on both portals. Would it and what, so we, now we have a, an answer, which is provided okay. by my general Thank counsel. You. They're according to uh, the data set, which is, I guess, the open data data set information. There were 3,003 views of this data set. Okay, that's very good. My 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 biggest concern, um, I, maybe the word concern is not the appropriate word. My my suggestion to you is that. All the information is in, you know, you're finding Sola, wouldn't it be easier to have everything in one place? I mean, Sola is where a lot of developers go, correct? So, so I'll, because I, and this is really a city planning domain, but I just learned that Zola, and I use Zola all the time myself, but I'm using it to find out what's the zoning, is this site located in a historic district, um, where's, can I get to, I can get to the tax map very easily, it has all these very handy links so that I can study that site and see what can be developed on that site. It doesn't have links to what's already developed on the site. Um, and which is really what we're talking about when we say special permits and variances. So it's arguably not the right place to go for that. Would it, would it be helpful just to even have a link there that would take them to open data just in case? I think so already has an open data link, but this is a really a domain of city planning. Okay. We use it, but we don't run it. City planning? <laughs> Um, so I am informed that um, Zola has a link to um, open data, but um, you know, CINI planning maintains different databases for different purposes. Zola has a specific purpose. Um, we have other, um, there are other maps and databases out there that have other purposes. And so our, our understanding is, is that if someone is um, looking to develop or looking for information, they will visit, you know, they can look in a number of different places, um, but there are links between them. I'm gonna come back. I have quite a few questions, but uh, I'm gonna give it to my co-chair, come back uh, after we hear from our colleagues, uh, because I really wanna get into the possibility of having uh, the map. Uh, I know it's difficult, uh, but usually I have learned the right, the difficult thing is the right thing. And so with that assumption, let me uh, pass it on to my co-chair. Thank you, uh, Chair. Cabrera, I want to recognize that we've also been joined by Chair Moya. Um, thank you for your statement. Um, the representative from the Buildings Department, if on the record, if you can just state your name. My name is Mona Siegel, okay. General Counsel at the Department of Buildings. Thank you, thank you. So my question here, um, can you briefly walk us through the BSA's conclusion that a zoning lot can be compromised of a partial tax lot and supporting evidence and arguments that the BSA considered in reaching that conclusion? Uh, who's this uh, I guess the BSA. Ah, so this is the, the actual subject of this is in active litigation, so I can't speak to this. You, you, you can just speak to, uh, in, in, in general, how, how you get I, to I these decisions? I can't because it's for the court to decide the answer. Okay. Um, can you walk us through why the BSA's majority disagreed with the Supreme Court's finding that um, the Department of Buildings currently in, uh, interprets of the zoning lot definition should not apply retroactively? Sorry, is this also related to the same case? Uh, no, this is just a general question. So what's the, I don't know what the question okay. is referring to. Okay, so can you walk us through why the BSA's 
majority disagreed with the Supreme Court's findings that the Department of Buildings' current interpretation of the zoning lots definition should not apply retroactively. I believe this has to do with the case that's in litigation, and I can't speak to that. So in the future, which interpretation will you use? Which interpretation as to? As to in terms of the? Whether a zoning lot can be converted into a partial tax lot. Yeah, whether a zoning lot can be converted into a partial tax lot. It's in active litigation. It's the court that will de decide what the right answer is with that. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to get my questions in order because I don't want to uh, interfere with your... Um... So uh, in terms of zoning lot mergers, as a matter of policy, does the Department of, uh, does DCP have a view on whether or not zoning lots should consist of a whole tax lot, not partial tax lots? I guess I'll ask DCP questions since... Um, you know. Okay. Um, we uh, uh, defer to the Department of Buildings when they get an application uh, for development and whether that application complies with the zoning resolution. With respect to a sp specific case, again, um, that, that uh, issue is in, in litigation at the moment. So does requiring that zoning lot, so does requiring that zoning lots be comprise of whole lots, promote clarity and transparency for the public, in your opinion? Yeah, again, um, I don't wanna repeat the same, I mean, to sound like a broken record, but the, the question of whether zoning lots can include partial tax lots or have to include the whole uh, entire tax lot is in active litigation and we just can't discuss that topic. All right. You know what? I'm going to hand this over to uh, Councilmember Kalos. I'm going to allow you to ask some of your specific questions on your bills, and uh, we'll come right back with our questions. Just to follow up on the uh, mapping, thank you for posting the data onto Open Data. It appears that you used the visualization tool built into Open Data in order to provide uh, mapping. There's currently only a filter. Uh, as to the status of different applications, if it is possible to add more filters so folks can filter down to their community board and other specific items, could you add those filters and they, then? You may be able to, just a second. This is the whiz on how to use it. <laughs> the, the, the answer is yes, because I'm building my own oh, visualization, okay. but I want to just make sure that okay. the default has more filters available. We will look into it. We will discuss it with it and uh, whatever is possible to implement, we will. The other issue is the reason we wanted the visualization is just to see how, how staggering all the variances are. And my, my read of this is that, the, at least on my screen, they, they appear to be very, very dense in terms of the numbers of dots. Uh, would it be possible uh, to update it uh, where you have, where there is a variance that is larger than one specific piece of property? Uh, if it's a variance for an entire block, if it is possible to, or mm -hmm. let me change it based on the yeah. nonverbals I'm getting. Are there ever <laughs> variances that are granted for more than just one building? Not are there ever block-wide variances? So a variance pertains to a zoning lot. So it's true that there could be a zoning lot. You, were, you actually are probably familiar with a case that um, you, you were involved with where a school on a much larger zoning lot, right? So the variance pertains to the school but it pertains to the entire zoning lot. So I think what you're saying is you would want to see the visualization of the zoning lot as opposed to the building that received the waiver. Actually, uh, n either or. I guess one, one question is just in support of my colleague's bill, and then I'll get back to my questions. Uh, you were able to do this for several thousand BSA variances. Is there, in, in your experience, do you think that another agency would be able to accomplish a similar task looking at the uh, zoning lots that have been merged? Well, our, the meets and bounds of our, uh, of our approvals are very clearly laid out in our resolutions. 
Um, so it, it's easy for us to know what they are. It, I don't know if it's so easy to actually map it other than to put a dot. Okay. Right? Did BSA ever hire a uh, appraiser? as I required by law? So, <laughs> yes, so we have been working very closely with DCAS and still um, have learned a lot about the cost of an appraiser and we're still working on trying to get funding for it. However, uh, we don't have the Please let DCAS it. and OMB know that they are violating the law and that if they do not give you your appraiser that, they, that, that is illegal and that you need it in order to do the financial analysis. Uh, with regard to, uh, let me just skip over to uh, DOB. I just want to add, though, we do have a financial specialist who sits on our board, so it's not that we're all um, uninformed about the financial analyses. It's just not an, a licensed appraiser. Uh, for, for DOB, are the zoning lot mergers uh, currently public information through ACRIS? Yes. Great. Uh, and do you see any issues with providing notice uh, to communities, to the community board, to the elected official, and what have you, when somebody makes their zoning lot mergers public? Um, I can't really speak to the effort there, but I just want to say that we do have uh, information that does get uh, sent to city council uh, members and to the community boards today through building on my block. Uh, so anytime there is uh, an approval that's filed um, or approval that's issued or a permit that's issued, um, uh, reports go out on a weekly basis to council members and to the community boards. On I have end. never gotten an email from building on my block. I will sign up for it. Yes. I literally have people on my staff <laughs> who log into the business uh, building information system every day to check what's going on with specific buildings in my district. So. Uh, can you sign me up for this? Um, we will take that information and someone on, at DOB will follow. So it sounds like the technology is already there to do this. And it's being done in this, in this way. Perfect. Is there an opportunity to require that anyone who uh, creates an option for a, a zoning lot uh, relating to development rights also have to file and provide that notice? similar to the statute of frauds in common law. Can you, I'm sorry, uh, council member, can you just repeat the beginning? This is for DOB or DCP. Is there an opportunity to say that not only when you file, but uh, following the lead of the statute of frauds, which requires that certain property transfers be required in writing, uh, can we require that any time a transfer in development rights uh, or an option relating thereto is recorded in writing that it must be filed within, with the city in order to be valid? Well, um, I can speak to what the Department of Buildings is um, looking at today under the law um, and whether or not you can require it legally um, may need to be uh, looked at more closely. Uh, so I don't know that I can speak to that. But certainly with respect to what we do today, um, uh, documents that are submitted to DOB come at the time when there is a need for construction document approval for a proposed development or enlargement. And it's at that time that my agency uh, requires documentation about zoning lot, any proposed zoning lot merger or zoning lot merger that may have been previously filed on ACRIS be submitted to DOB to support the uh, zoning calculations for that development or enlargement. If I may have one follow-up question. Uh, at 180 East 88th Street, it so happened that the zoning lots and tax lots hadn't been subdivided as they had said so in their DOB filings, and they were nonetheless approved. How does somebody get an approval for a building when they haven't actually done the zoning lot merger or subdivision yet? Um, so I think you're talking about Third Avenue? Correct. Uh, okay. Um, uh, if there was, and I can't, I don't recall the specifics of that case, however, to the extent that there was any issue that did come up, um, it was corrected. I, I guess the only concern is just, and again, why I like my colleague's bill so much, it took me and a, an urban planner several hours to find it so that we could raise it to DOB who had already approved it without the changes. And uh, then it took several months, but there was a corrective action, but DOB 
is ostensibly the gatekeeper in making sure people follow the laws. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And with that, uh, Councilmember Powers. Thank you. Thanks. Just a few quick questions. I, I missed uh, a little bit of the conversation with Councilman Kales. Are, are, is there an opinion or support or opposition to the, his legislation related to the air rights transfers? I don't think I saw it in the testimony. I am a sponsor of the bill. It is our bill. That's correct. We're just trying to make sure that we are discussing the correct uh, intro number. Okay. The it is the legislation bill. that requires notification, and I'll give you the bill number. It is 1701. Okay. okay. Um, we. Uh, uh, support the idea of transparency in creation of zoning lots going forward. There's some details that we would work with the council to uh, on the bill, um, but generally we, we uh, are supportive of the bill. Okay, and did I hear a, a comment earlier that there is some notification given today related to this information? Because I similarly don't recall um, my office or when I was a community board member, the community board getting information related to that, uh, to those, to air rights transfers. So, uh, with respect to the Department of Buildings involvement, um, we are not involved in private agreements involving air right transfers. Uh, when Department of Buildings gets involved, it's at the time when an applicant comes to the agency to file construction documents. It's after they've done the, they've gotten the air rights, it's when they're filing their plans and, and for permits, so that's correct. Those air rights are private agreements. Yeah, okay, I got it, I got it. Um, are there any technical hurdles or any lo like logistical hurdles related to providing that information to community board, borough president, elected official from city planning or BSA? Uh, um, city planning doesn't get information about private uh, um, agreements among landowners, so um, and and we don't get uh, you know the declarations or d other documents filed with us. So um, from our perspective, um, we wouldn't have the information to provide to anyone. Okay. And, and to add to that, the BSA really has nothing to do with zoning lot mergers that go on as of right. Okay, I appreciate it. Um, Councilor Rick Hales noted to me that if you go on the building on my block website, uh, there's not a sign up for emails, so I think maybe perhaps we're provided with that information, but can the public sign up for that to get information about their, uh, what's happening on their block in an email format rather than having to go on manually? All right, so um, just getting updated, a couple of things. Um, buildings on my block, you have to go to the website to get that information. However, I do want to um, say today uh, to you, council member, that we have a new effort that is in the works, um, and my uh, DOB staff can follow up uh, as needed uh, with, your, with your staff. Um, but the new effort is soon to launch um, to allow members of the public to sign up to receive email updates on construction projects um, of interest, and so that will be an effort that we do hope to launch shortly. Do you know what shortly the timeline, what that is, what the timeline is? I'm being told that it would be next month. Next month, okay, that's great, thank you. Um, the, uh, just switching topics, uh, since the topic here is general operations of the Board of Standards and Appeals. Um, can you just tell us, I think there's five commissioners right now, full-time commissioners of the BSA, all appointed by the mayor. Um, are they, so? I, I, just clarification, subject to advice and consent by the city council? Yes. Okay. Um, has there been any, been any discussion? I mean, city planning has appointees from the city council or the people of our presidents. Uh, uh, you know, it, it strikes me the mayor has all the power here in terms of appointments to the BSA, which is an appeals process, yet, you know, for, Council, we have many projects that come through the B, you know, in our districts and our communities that come through the BSA. Has there ever been a discussion about in, in expanding the uh, uh, composition or changing who has appointments to the BSA? 
So if you had participated in the thrilling Charter Revision Commission hearings, you would have seen quite a lot of testimony on this subject or discussion on this subject. Um, I know council members right. submitted some testimony um, on that. <laughs> so the, of course there were proposals and during the Charter Revision Commission uh, proceedings uh, to expand the BSA from five to as many as 13 commissioners right. appointed by very many different kinds of people. But I, I do want to clarify here that though the commissioners are, the five commissioners are appointed by the mayor with advice and consent of the council, once they're appointed, they're, uh, they are not permitted by rule to be contacted by anyone once an application has been filed and is pending before the board. So, uh, so whether or not it's appointed by the mayor or anybody else, um, it's not as if anyone can call a commissioner and say, vote the way I'd like you to vote. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not questioning independence here. Okay. It's just about composition because in other agencies we have the full, like a, an idea, maybe an ideological belief that you know, different forms of appointment and representation are important. Is there an opinion of whether the composition should be, even if not even, whether the appointment uh, division of appointments or, or sort of overall composition should be looked at? Um, I think it was extremely heavily looked at in the last few months, so. I'm asking if you have an opinion on it. Um, I think it was heavily looked at. I think actually the composition um, is, is the right idea. The, the issue really of who's on the BSA has to do with expertise. And it may sound easy to find the people with the kind of expertise that needs to be on the board, but it is not easy. And, um, and one of the requirements is that we have a representative from, uh, say, no more than two representatives from each borough. And uh, the ideal is one representative from each borough. And for example, finding a structural engineer with the kinds of expertise that's necessary to review our applications, who wants to come work for the city of New York and not work for one of the big engineering companies is no small feat, and that's true about all of the other experts. So, uh, right, I appreciate it. my final question. Is there an appointee from every borough right now? There, we have actually two from Queens at the moment. Two from Queens, okay. I won't ask which boroughs are unre unrepresented, I'll figure it out. Thank you. It's actually Brooklyn, surprisingly. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Uh, any questions from my colleagues before the chairs uh, start asking questions? All right, so with that, let me come back. Uh, at the February 20, fifth hearing on the Governmental Operations Committee, the BSA testified that a clerical system will be necessary to implement 1095-2018 uh, uh, with regards to expiration notification. The BSA also stated that the resources were presenting a challenge in implementing local law 102 of 2017 regarding access to a state certified real estate appraiser. As DCAS, and I know, I know that question was asked, but if you could get into a little bit more detail, has DCAS granted BSA access to such a appraiser? If not, do you happen to give it a little more detail? Was hindering as the B, uh, the BSA? Have you identified other areas of need? And will the BSA require additional resources in order to implement the legislation before the committee today? So I, d I just want to, before we go to the appraiser, I think one part of your question was about an IT person for notification. Right. So yes, we actually were able to happily, thankfully, I, I want to actually thank um, Councilmember Kalos for his help on that. We're able to um, hire an IT person and a compliance officer um, both of whom work on a database now, which will do much more than what the bill is suggesting. The bill suggests that we just notify um, uh, recipients of variances that were granted since 2013. 
that their variances are about to expire. Um, we don't typically grant variances with terms of years. We've had only three in that time, but we have many other kinds of applications that have terms of years, and we're working on a database that will eventually notify those people that their special permits and other kinds of waivers are about to expire. Um, so we're very thankful for that staff. In terms of the appraiser, um, I, I'm not sure if you're aware of the sort of the, the, the budget situation in the city, but we also have a very tiny staff, and we've recently you really lost. Do. Yeah, very tiny. Very, very tiny staff that handles about 700 applications a year. And we've recently lost um, some critical staff members. And so the, in order to keep the place running, we actually have to focus on replacing them first. Uh, so that affects our budget. And then um, the appraiser, as it turns out, is a uh, is much more complicated than we realized. Um, we had thought it would be through a contract, but apparently um, what we had thought of as a contract relationship is not feasible. So under the current structure. So what structure will you have in place in you order wanna, yeah. to? So Carlos Costanza should Thank you, you Carlos. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, so we, we thought that there were existing uh, contracts already in place that we could perhaps piggyback on. With mm. the we, we've been told, or my understanding is that that's not possible. We would have to put out our own RFP um, to have our own separate contract. Um, when we started gauging what that would cost or what we would get for the monies that have been allocated uh, for this bill, it appears that if we were to get a contract uh, and, and successfully you know, put out the RFP, have bidders and, and meet the contractual requirements, that we probably would get maybe two to three appraisals out of it. They're very expensive. Mm. Um, so then we started to consider perhaps what the feasibility of hiring a licensed appraiser. But, um, you know, obviously we don't have that uh, approval, that par in place. And again, for that level of criteria, it's, it's pretty, you know, it can be almost at an executive level to have a, a New York State license appraiser that would be willing to, to come. So we haven't, um, we haven't engaged that yet. We're scoping it to see what the feasibility is or the possibility. But that's the two options so far that we've had. So when the, what's the next step? I mean, uh, you're considering, you looked at the two options. Uh, when is, what's the next steps that make sense? And second of all, uh, by when do you foresee? I mean, are, are, you, are you kind of in a bind that you have to wait until next June of the new budget? Because what, what I'm hearing between the line is a funding issue, right? It's the funding and the, you know, the prospect of, of finding a candidate that you know meets whatever civil service requirement, whatever right. available, and what that salary would look like. So, um, you know, to, to meet the criteria of a New York State licensed appraiser that has a certain amount of years of experience, that uh, has experience familiar with what our needs are. And again, obviously, if we were to hire someone on staff, um, we'd you know utilize that that employee. You know, what would be the implication of waiting all the way into the next fiscal cycle? So I, I just want to, I, I, a lot of this comes from not actually, I think the bill itself came from not really understanding how the BSA currently operates. One of our commissioners is a very experienced um, financial analyst. She's not a, a licensed appraiser, but we rely very heavily on her analysis of the pro formas that come in. That's actually what's going on for a, the few variances that are for-profit variances. In the course of a year, we get maybe 10 or so. Is that about right? Yeah, and 20, about 10. The rest are yeah. typically non-for-profit, schools, uh, right. single family homes that don't require a financial finding. Uh, right. financial, uh, so, we, so of those 10, we're looking deeply at those financials. But, and so 
Um, it's not that we're in dire straits. We looked at it instead as a great advantage to have somebody um, on staff who we could ask for other for sort of data that that an appraiser has access to that we don't have access to. Uh, let me move on to the next question because I know we have our esteemed uh, Manhattan Borough President who's going to be testifying. Thank you, <laughs> Dale, you're always amazing. Uh, the, uh, as the board chair, uh, you recu uh, recuse yourself from voting due to prior connections to a matter before the five-member board. Can you uh, please explain what the board's uh, protocol for recuse Sure. Recusal is under what circumstances have other members of the board chosen to recuse themselves, and have there been situations where more than one person has recused him or herself, and what happens in those instances? Okay. So, in terms of how recusal works, when a board member, um, the, the, the standard rule that's really the conflict of interest board rule is that if there is some sort of financial connection, to that project, you must recuse. And by a financial connection, it can even be that um, you have some um, either familial or business connection to an applicant, and therefore, if the applicant um, does or doesn't succeed in, in the project, then somehow or other that would affect you personally, right? So that's the standard conflict of interest board rule. So whenever a board member is confronted with that possibility, they consult with our general counsel, and then in turn they go to the conflict of interest board to see if it rises to the level of requiring recusal. Typically, no one else knows the reason for the recusal. That's intentional because uh, we're concerned that knowing the reason for the recusal might affect other board members and staff members' opinion about the case. That's very good. Um, in my case, and then we have another lawyer on the board, in both of our cases, I recuse also when um, I view that there might be a, a lawyer's ethical interest that would be compromised. For example, if that was my client and I have special information about that case, then I would recuse, which is different than a conflict of interest board recusal. In terms of two two board members recusing. I haven't seen that happen, but a we have three is enough to, to vote on a, on a case. But if you have a four left and you have a split vote, have you ever had that situation? A situation, well, we've had situations, for example, well, when we didn't have enough commissioners, right? So we had four commissioners and one had to recuse, right? Then we had three. Okay. Uh, if we're ever in a situation where we only have two, it's a, such an interesting question. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. We haven't been confronted. So you haven't crossed that Yeah, point. happily. <laughs> okay. All right. Let me move on to DCP uh, concerning intro 1691 and intro 1692. Bulk of work for enumerating each zoning lot will be in, in first identifying each zoning lot and its consti constituent tax lot. First, uh, Help me understand, can you walk us through the steps needed to identify a single zoning lot, what archives and records need to be assessed to accomplish these steps, and which ones are digitized versus manual? What is the work, if I'm asking too many questions at the same time, please <laughs> let me know. What is the work involved in enumerating uh, zoning lots beyond identifying the constitu constituent tax law? Uh, what additional staff resources would DCP <coughs> accomplish this process? Um, let me sort of yeah, I know I give you a take that role. generally. I have more, <laughs> but you know, um, the the issue on uh, zoning lots um, really is an historical issue, um, going back you know pre the first zoning resolution. There are a, a lot of uh, uh, d buildings and structures in the city that predate the first zoning resolution, that predate certificates of occupancy that had the meets and bounds in them, and that even predate, or clearly that predate the 1961 zoning resolution that actually first defined zoning lots. So there are, and I think I, in my testimony said, there's you know tens of thousands of, of, of lots conservatively that just don't even have zoning lot designations. Um, and then pre-1977, there was no uh, general requirement that zoning lots actually um, file um, the zoning lot 
the establishment of zoning lots with uh, any particular agency. So um, the, the current requirements about filing date to 1977, about recording, um, pre-1977, um, it's not really a question of what resources we would need. We just think it would be impossible. Um, you basically, we think you'd have to go and look at the city and we're talking on a, on a, on a, a city-wide basis, you'd have to go look at all lots in the city and do research and try and figure out, is there a zoning lot or does this predate? And, and then is, what's the zoning lot? One does it, you know, the developers need to do it on a, on a lot by lot basis and it can be done that way. And, and as Council Member Kalo said, sometimes it can take a lot of time to do. And, and um, that's our understanding that it can be very difficult when you're just focusing on one lot um, to do it on a citywide basis. It's not really a question of resource, it's a question of possibility. Going forward, though, we do. So let me stop you there, because it, uh, can you repeat that? It's, it's not an issue of resources. I it, mean, it, if it, you had the right resources, uh, anything is possible, right? It, Especially it, in New York City. So if you had enough resources, it could get done. Uh, and part of my frustration is what Council Member Kalos experiencing so, especially in districts like his and Manhattan and so forth, that uh, it just takes a tremendous, first of all, you need a tremendous amount of will to go through the whole process. Uh, you gotta get people who know what they're doing, it's costly. Uh, it actually discourages the average normal person to be able, who don't have the resources, uh, to go ahead and find it on their own. I, uh, how do we, I mean, are we gonna have this problem forever? Is, is that, that's my issue. Uh, you know, I, I hear the kind of the same arguments that almost when I drafted the crime map bill, uh, and we got it done. It's, it's online, uh, and, and I know this is a little bit more liberous, but uh, it can be done. So, I, so let me just ask you, how much do you foresee that it will cost? Uh, to get it done? I, I have no way of estimating what it would cost or how many people because really what you're, what it would require would be looking at, you know, New York City as a whole on a lot by lot basis and then doing research on a lot by lot basis that could go back, um, you know, it could go back 100 years, it could go back 20 years and, and we don't know, but New York has tens of thousands of, of lots. So um, the, 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 we, do, you know, we do support the goal of, of creating transparency going forward. Um, and it's really just the his, going back historically given the way that the city has developed and the requirements that have been applicable at various times over the city's history. Can you uh, start now uh, moving forward or are you identifying moving forward? Well, the City Planning Commission does, or the City Plan Department of City Planning does not get those filings. Um, you know, we, um, I think as, as others have testified, there are certain declarations that get filed with the city register and then when a developer is going to uh, Department of Buildings to get approval to move ahead, they have to have certain filings with the Department of Building. Um, filings about zoning lots, um, creation of new zoning lots don't come to city planning. They haven't, um, and, and we don't have that ability. Tell me here, uh, and do you think that we should require developers that once the transfer happen, not when they get to oh, DOB, because that could be years, right? Uh, and I think that was part of the problem with 200 abstinence, I know you can't talk about it, but in theory, uh, forget 200. Uh, if we had a scenario similar to that, I think part of the problem is we are, you know, we le letting the developers um, determine when to file, which is basically when they're getting ready to, uh, uh, to file with DOB. Wouldn't it make sense that as soon as they make the agreement, that by law we will require them to do so? 
Well, generally, the agreements among the developers are private agreements. I can't really speak to the legality of when uh, it, one can actually require that something be disclosed or not. Would it be helpful if, if, if there was a mandate to require them to do an ASAP once agreement? I, I just okay. I can't speak to the whether that is something that's doable, that's legal or not. Okay. Uh, so getting back to the question that I didn't let you answer <laughs> completely. Uh, moving forward, is this something that you're looking to do to get it done? Uh, and piggybacking with that question is can we start with the easiest cases that don't go like way back, like you mentioned, hundreds of year where it's gonna require more effort uh, by somebody doing the research? So every time DOB gets a permit, as we move forward. Well, we do support the goal of, of moving forward when um, uh, there are, are filings of being more transparent about that. Um, and we're, um, you know, we look forward to working with the council to figure out the best way of doing that. Um, so will you be supportive, in theory, and I know we're not working out all the details here right now, that if the bill were to be amended uh, to cover moving from here forward, that would be something that you'll be open to? I think we would have to talk about the precise details of it with the council, but um, you know, it's, it's again, the filings don't come to the Department of City Planning, but as a city, I think the city agencies and the council can w work together to figure out what the best way of making this happen is. Okay. Um. Would intro 1692 as drafted interfere in any way with SOLA's existing mapping of tax law in zoning districts? Uh, well, I, you know, I think to the extent we don't think that it's possible to achieve. The, uh, but in theory, if it was well, it's hard, possible. Well, it's hard to, hard to, hard to talk about it in theory when we don't think it's possible to map. Uh, if we were to have the scenario that I just uh, share with you, the possibility of from moving here forward, uh, would there would there be any uh, uh, would there be any interference? Um, it was a very theoretical matter. Yes, um, I, I I would have to go back and talk to our our Zola, the people who were responsible the data and adding data in Zola to, to, un, to understand what can and can't be done and whether something should be on Zola or some other platform. Do you foresee any costs associated with updating Zola to add the shape files? Uh, well, I think that putting it again the side of the, aside the question of whether it's possible to create shape files, um, I think that's the, the that's really the largest issue here is the actual data and creation of shape files to begin with. What about adding another layer? Is that costly? Uh, another layer. It, the actual, if you have files, adding another uh, adding. Shape files. My understanding is that's not a huge cost. It's the actual creation of the shape files that is the cost. Um, and then, and here is I think we made clear we don't think it would be possible. Gotcha. I have uh, another question, but I'm going to turn it over uh, to my co-chair Rafael Salamanca. Thank you, uh, Chair Cabrera. We've been joined by uh, Council Member Barron and Reynoso. I'm going to allow Council Member Reynoso to ask a few questions. Thank you. I just have a couple of questions. I want to thank the chairs for having this uh, hearing, and thank you for, for being here. Um, I have uh, two main questions. Uh, the, um, we don't know at this moment the amount of uh, lot, I guess, mergers 
that is that exists in the city of New York in any like uh, easily accessible uh, forum or, or system. Um, can we agree with that? We do, yes, we do not. We do not know, and I don't think anyone knows precisely all the zoning lots that exist in, okay. in the city. Um, the, the primary function of the Department of City Planning is to plan. Um, it, it just very difficult for me to understand how an agency responsible for um, ensuring some type of like comprehensive continuity to the way we look at our city and what we expect in the future to not be able to take into account uh, merging of lots. Um, it, it just feels very fundamental to the work that I think you should be doing. Um, so for me, it's concerning that we, we just don't do that in a, in a, in a meaningful way. Uh, um, and I got concerned on whether or not uh, DCP at some time in its existence thought maybe that's something we should be doing more, more comprehensively to make sure that we're taking into account um, what I think in some cases are very significant changes to, um, or, or unintended consequences of planning, I guess, right? Those are things that you don't account for, whether you planned for a, a building to be, let's say, 20 stories and because of a transfer of lots or uh, purchasing of air rights, then it ends up being 40 stories. Uh, I don't think you planned for that necessarily, uh, but if it does happen, I think you should account for it. Um, but we're not accounting for that. Um, so I guess that's all a statement, not, not a question. But my point being is, is it in your interest, I guess, to, to, to want to have this information available to, yourself, to you? Um, well, you know, we have an as of right um, zoning structure in the city, and so if a uh, property owner can comply with the, the bulk and the use regulations um, that exist, then our view is, is that, and they have an as of right, they can build as of right under the, the, the use and bulk regulations. We don't regulate transfers, um, uh, property transactions. Um, we don't have the authority to represent, uh, to regulate property transactions. And so we just look at the use and bulk uh, allowed by the zoning regulations. And if um, property owners have agreements among themselves or buy and sell you know, property or amass property and comply with the zoning regulation, we think that's appropriate. So because we can't control it or it's as of right, it doesn't matter? No, I, I, the, the as of right is there's already been a, a the zoning resolution allows it. And so if the zoning resolution allows something as of right, then the property owner is entitled to build uh, what the zoning resolution Yeah, and I, don't, and I don't think anyone here objects to that. I think what we're objecting to is not knowing uh, it seems like just that lack of information or not knowing is, is counter to planning. Uh, it's on, it, unless those were your intended consequences, that in some cases these, this area that we've rezoned in 1960 to allow for six-story buildings can now have a building that's 30 stories because of a transfer of air rights and we accounted for that, then that's perfectly fine. But it's it just when it comes to planning, uh, having that information I think has value. And I just, uh, I just really feel like there is a, like a, dim a dismissive nature in the Department of City Planning on things that they just feel that they have no influence in or can't control. But the least we can do is have information. Um, and for me, the biggest concern is that you've never asked for this information or it isn't something that you've thought was important to have. And I don't know if you can plan without having that information. Now, the legislation as we've written it, or as I understand it, especially the one I'm on, doesn't ask for us to stop uh, the as of right development to happen. It doesn't ask for us to, to, um, uh, to get information prior to a transaction happening. These are all happening afterwards, like just the way that it happens now. We wouldn't interfere with that in any way, shape, or form. The process by which you merge lots will consistently, will stay consistent. The only thing we would be doing is we would be getting information about it now. Now we would know that these things happen after the fact. So. But, but I just don't understand, I guess, in planning, how this wouldn't be something that you would want prior to uh, the city council moving forward with it. Right, and, and we, we, we do support um, the goal of um, identifying uh, zoning lots and, and changes in zoning lots, development of new zoning lots or uh, going forward. Our, our, our concern is that looking backwards, it's just not possible to 
um, given the history of New York City and the requirements that have been in existence really pre-1977 to create a citywide uh, map. So, uh, and I understand the history situation, and I guess what I'm getting to is that you should have been doing this on your own. If you're a planning department, it should have been something that you wanted to do. It just is beyond me how that, that's not the case. But um, I guess I, I want to end it by saying um, I'm not a NIMBYist by nature. Uh, I, I respect as of right development. I don't, I don't challenge them. I can't challenge them. I don't have the authority to do it. But I like to know that they're happening. Um, and I am still having conversations regarding one of the pieces of legislation and don't want it to take on the effect of allowing for communities that might not want a development that is happening as of right to be able to challenge it. Um, and we're like in this, in this ground or I'm having this, 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 uh, this gray area that I'm fighting with where I want to have the information, but I don't necessarily want it to be used to stop um, what I consider as of right developments. Um, so I'm trying to figure that out. Um, I don't want to encourage the Nimbius in being able to do that work, but I do think this is information we need. And I don't know how to reconcile that just yet, but I, I'm trying to figure that out uh, on my own. And that's why even on the legislation that I'm a part of, I have issues with. Uh, but I do think this is information you should at least want. Um, uh, so uh, I guess that's where I'll close my statements uh, and I want to just thank uh, the chairs for giving me this time. Yeah, I, by the way, I wasn't rushing you. I was looking at you because I was about to interject on something. So if, if you don't interject it. chair. Okay. <laughs> no. I hear, but you know, it's just <laughs> no. courtesy. Thank you. Thank colleagues. you uh, but I, 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 I just want to zone in a little bit more here. So when we're talking about somebody comes, they had an agreement, two landlords, uh, transferring the air rights to another, they go to DOB. At that point, can't we assign a number moving here forward, identifying tax? Would it be that difficult to do that? It would seem to me it's not that difficult. Going it, forward? Forward. Um, so forward. It, I can't speak for DOB. It, it might be possible. It wouldn't come to us at all. Um, if it's, you know, an as of right development, we wouldn't see. Uh, can you repeat that again? I'm sorry. I was. I said going, f f I'm not speaking for DOB, but for, s for city planning, if it's an as of right development, it would not come to us at all. So, so we wouldn't. So DOB then. So we wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, DOB? Um, so, let, oh, so to put this in context, when they come to DOB, they have filed uh, the um, meets and bounds of the proposed zoning lot or zoning lot that they're uh, looking to develop on uh, um, at the city register. And, um, and, um, uh, and at that point, um, it's been filed publicly somewhere. They come to DOB and they submit it again. Um, now, in terms of assigning a number, I, I guess I'm just I'm not sure uh, how that would work in my agency. It feels like uh, I don't know. Is it? I, I just can't guess to how that would work. Maybe uh, both of your agencies could uh, work. Department could work together and try and figure that out. Look, I, I'm trying to find the easiest way moving forward because if we keep doing what we're doing we're going to end up with the same results I'm, I'm a firm believer in systems and what i see is that we have a system in place right now that is just repeating history over and over again and we 10 years from now there's going to be another chair here asking the same question about something that we could have an impact already that is going to be helpful to our constituents and to everyone who is trying to get this uh, type of information that is going to save time. It saves you time as well from people knocking on your doors, uh, looking for answers, asking questions. Uh, at the end of the day, I would see that it will be profitable to, uh, to you as well. And so uh, it would seem to me that, uh, that it's logical and reasonable, and it doesn't take a lot of effort. As a matter of fact, let me go a little deeper. Every time that we have, and you will have to identify what that is, anything that they come to you for, uh, not just in that case, uh, you know, study situation, uh, that it will make sense uh, whenever it's feasible uh, to uh, assign, you know, the number. So that way we could start moving forward and, and 
being productive. Can you give me one second? What about uh, using the city register? Would that be whenever something is filed, Department of Finance? Anybody here from the Department of Finance? I think uh, Annette Hill. Annette, how are you? Can you please come? I'm gonna throw you in real quickly. Raise your hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. And if you could please identify yourself. Annette Hill, City Register. Okay, my wise counsel <laughs> behind me had really um, identify a good, uh, maybe process and system we could play, uh, have here. When they come and file with you, uh, they have to file with you before going to DOB. Why can we uh, put this system in place and they could have the identifying tax number, okay. tax lot number? When a filing is done, it has to be done on a tax lot that exists already. And they usually come, development rights usually come in a deed form. It, you can't separate it out, so it would be difficult to separate it out out of a deed. But can you, can you put a process that is parallel with that to make it happen? We would have to have them recorded separately out, and a, a development rights on air right does not have a tax lot associated with it, so it has to be it has to be on a tax lot that exists already. So you can't have it separated out f from the deed form. Why? Because it does not have a lot number assigned to the air right separately. It has to be on a tax lot that exists already. Uh, Look, maybe, may, may, let me reframe it this way. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of, we have a lot of experience right here in this panel, uh, years that actually precedes me, I, 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 is my estimation. And I know we could figure this out. My concern is the way we're doing it right now, we're gonna keep getting the same result with the same frustration coming year after year, and we're gonna get the same answers. I'm trying to, Please help me figure out uh, in a collective way right here to all the panelists here representing the administration, how can we make this happen moving forward? Uh, it would just seem to me that, you know, I, I, I'm a big believer in systems. Systems, I, I'm more of a believer in systems than goals because you could never get to your goal unless you have a system in place. So. Is there a way, and you don't have to come out with a magic answer right now, but can you help, let's work together and then to find a process to make it happen. I know I'm putting you a spot, asking right now to come up with something that's never done before, and, uh, and I know there's always this hesitation of committing to something, right? But I, I'm coming in good faith here to try to figure out not to get this I got you kind of attitude, how can we come up with something that really works for everyone, including uh, all of your agencies? Okay, well, something we would like to have to explore um, some more conversation with council as well if we're doing the finance of how we could make that happen. Okay. But we need further conversation on it. Thank you, thank you uh, for uh, all of you being open-minded. Let me uh, give it back to my co-chair. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chair Cabrera. Uh, I want to recognize that we've been joined by a Councilmember Yeager. And Councilmember Yeager, we'll give you five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, uh, good morning. Um, first, uh, I just wanted to ask of DCP. Um, I, I actually agree with some of your objections to uh, to the uh, uh, retroactive recordation. Um, 
understanding that it's complicated because so many of these uh, zoning law changes are either by private agreement or have been recorded in the city register and there's no kind of master book that you can go to without actually doing years and years of research to go through every single lot and see what it currently is linked to. So I understand that. And moving forward, I think it would be a good idea to have a master list. But I, I do have a question about uh, your second to last paragraph of your testimony, and I apologize that I've been in and out, but I have another hearing next door. And, um, uh, you indicate that, uh, you represent to us, that intro 1691 uh, would change the city charter in such a fashion that it would be required to have a referendum. Uh, my understanding of the charter and the limitations on the council to amend the charter, we do it all the time here, is that uh, uh, we can't curtail an authority that the charter has given to the other branch of government, but we surely, I believe, can assign a task to an agency, um, whether that agency likes it or not, notwithstanding, uh, particularly in light of that section uh, then currently numbered 11 uh, in, the, in the section that you're referring to says perform such other functions as or assigned to him or her by the mayor or other provisions of law. We have the ability to assign you a task. Um, if you don't want to do it, I guess that's okay. You don't have to. Most agencies don't do what we tell them anyway, so that's cool. But um, I, I, I would just respectfully differ with your legal interpretation of the restrictions on this council to assign a task to a city agency. Uh, that's not a question, that's just a statement, and um, I'll move on from that. But I do agree that retroactive recordation and creating this master list is problematic, and I understand the conundrum that, that you find uh, and how it would be difficult to comply if it's meant to go retroactive. Um, I have a question for the chair of the BSA. It's good to see you again, ma'am. Um, I, I, uh, during your conversation with Councilman Powers, um, you indicated something which I've heard before, is that by rule of your agency, nobody can talk to any commissioner during any time. Not, not any time, once an application has been Once filed. an application has been, what does that mean exactly? So. Does that mean that I can't pick up the phone and call a member of the Board of Standards and Appeals? Correct. By whose authority do you promulgate a rule that says that a government official paid by the city of New York can't be called by a legislator here in the city of New York or by the commissioner of the police department in the city of New York or by anybody else? By whose authority do we promulgate a rule? I would That's, need, I'd and, need and is it enforceable? I assume that you believe that the rules promulgated by the board are enforceable, but um, is, do you know of any other agency that has a rule that says that, uh, that other government officials, I'm not saying that, that the guy on the number four train can knock on the door of your house and start asking you questions mm -hmm. about an application. I don't know if he can or can't. I'm not talking about that. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about your colleagues in government. So do I know of any other agency? I used to be a Landmarks Commissioner. We were forbidden from speaking to anyone about pending applications. If someone came to us, we were instructed to um, advise the council's office or the press office uh, that someone reached out to us and then that, that person on those offices would respond to the, the questioner. So the reason that we created that rule was really to formalize our existing practice, which was to not allow any commissioners to speak to anyone outside um, of our own agency um, about a pending application so as to keep their review and opinions um, purely uh, focused on the record before them as opposed to influenced by anyone who might have had ex parte communications because all of our uh, review is based on the testimony that's either submitted in writing or given to us at a public hearing. So it's to keep the review process very clean and that's something that the board has practiced for, I actually don't know how long, but, um, and this was just really to formalize it by rulemaking, and that's, that's why. Are the commissioners banned from reading newspapers? No, 
Of okay. course, they're not banned. Why not? Right. We do that with right. jurors during the pending uh, not deliberation. Well, that would be a great idea. So the, but that's different. So that's more similar to public testimony. So when we know a community is opposed to a project, they come and they give testimony, usually quite detailed. And more than that, they also submit testimony. So that's quite a different thing than a personal phone call where we don't know what the context of the phone call is, where it might be a threat, it might be something else. Um, and so we just want to avoid that entirely. It makes it just a lot cleaner. Do you have a list of streets that commissioners are not allowed to drive down on a why, regular? Why? Just in case there's a No, so site inspections and so on are something that's done regularly by commissioners. But that's um, not part of the public record unless you decide to enter it into the public no, record. No, it is actually part of the public record. I, uh, I said the second part of my sentence oh. was, was it's not part of the public record unless you decide to enter it into the public record. But if one of the commissioners decides to drive down East whatever street and take a look at a building, it's only if the, that commissioner decides to enter his or her observations into the matter, into the public record, that it becomes public record. Otherwise, it's just what he or she saw and then she goes to the movies. So, I mean, I'm, my point is that you, you're, you're uh, attempting to limit one, and wisely, it's a broad, it's a broad uh, limitation, but you're attempting to limit one method by which people may affirmatively reach out, but you're not locking off the board from receiving extraneous information. Um, perhaps it's not affirmatively being reached out with this extraneous information, but you can read newspapers, you can read websites, you can read articles, you can drive down streets, none of which is part of the public record. Why is it such a big deal if a colleague in government, so, I'm not saying that, I've, by the way, I don't want anybody they, who's watching this to think that that's because right. we've had an issue where I tried to call and you hung up on me. That's not what mm -hmm. occurred. It never happened. I don't, I'm, it's, I'm not taking personal offense by any way. Right. I really am just trying to understand the legal basis by which a, an agency says nobody can talk to us. And okay. I, I so, do believe you're the only agency that does this. Well, we're also arguably the only agency that often gets a prop, we may be the only agency that is often accused of uh, being affected by uh, call, we're often accused of being affected by calls from, for example, the mayor's office and so on, and so this was our way of demonstrating that in fact, no, we're not affected by that, but I do want to say that site visits are not extraneous. Site visits are very much a part of our understanding of an application, um, so it's actually part of the standard review process for us to go and visit the sites to understand better what, how the building situates in the community and, and so on. Okay. And again, this- I, I don't want to beat this down, but, okay. but you know, the, the, the notion that, and I'll, I'll make this my final point on this topic, but the notion that, that an agency, a number of commissioners can, can set themselves back and put up a brick wall and, you know, it would be, to me, a tune, uh, uh, similar to the police commissioner saying, uh, no council member can ever call me. And I think there are, well, some council members hate the police department, but except for the ones that don't, I don't think that that would be an issue. And I, I think that, well, I kind of made and clear I what just, I think. I just Chair. want to finish that. We're more similar in our thinking to the way a court operates, where it would not be proper for judges to be approached by uh, appellants um, or plaintiff and so on okay. um, during the course of a proceedings. I, I want to ask a, a question about uh, intro. I know you support it, and and I'm actually I don't I don't really care either way. I assume most people tell the truth. Um, that's and I don't know why we bother swearing people in here in the council. I think that's ridiculous. But uh, do you find, uh, with regard to intro 1723, do you find a lot of lying going on in your agency? People come there and they just lie right and left. Um, I would just have to say it depends. <laughs> Uh, we, uh, and I just want to, my counsel just showed me that um, a, a administrative ju law judges are also um, prohibited from ex parte communication. They have that funny word in their title, right? Judge. Well, we're quasi-judicial agency. Quasi. So also funny word. There's the quasi part, that's the yes. judicial part, and that's what we go on. Right, well, your but, commissioners. Um, in, in terms of the, uh, we, we occasionally have, so we do now swear most of the people in who come to uh, um, appear before us. Um, and uh, in that process, which I found quite helpful, frankly, because um, they actually, right at the beginning of their testimony, raise their hands and swear. Um, and then I can say to them, you're under oath, are you sure you want to hold to that statement? And we have caught, actually, applicants in 
misstatements, whether they were lies is uh, another subject, but let's just say misstatements. Um, we, when we've caught them, we've tried to get them to change their position, and when they don't change their position and we believe they are misrepresenting, we report them to the Department of Investigation, and we, we, we say at the hearing that we believe uh, we have some issues with the veracity and may take this up further. So um, does it happen a lot? It actually depends on the type of application. All right, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, Madam Thank you, Thank you, thank you, uh, Council Member. Um, I just have one last question, um, and then we're gonna go on to the next panel. Uh, Department of Buildings, all right? Um, you know, I'm trying to get a straight up answer, and I feel like I'm not getting it from this hearing. If a developer comes into the Department of Buildings today to pull a permit on a zoning lot that is comprised of a partial tax lot, okay, that's comprised of partial tax lots, all right, with an S, Will the Department of Buildings approve or disapprove that permit, assuming that no individual tax lot has enough FAR to build that building? So this is again, um, I, I appreciate the question, and um, this is again. Um, what will the Department directly. of Buildings do? Would you give them that permit or you won't give them that permit? That's the answer that I'm trying to get from you. Let or will just, you wait? Let me just answer yeah. it in this way, Counts uh, ch Chair. Um, uh, in in light of the ongoing litigation, uh, the um, uh, we have uh, not revised um, uh, our existing um, uh, memos on this, and so we would have to take a look at an issue if it were to come. Um, come to us, but at this point, because of the litigation, I really can't speak any further on that point unless I have a specific matter. So, so all future applicants that are trying to go through this process, you're putting them on hold because of this pending litigation? I would need to know if there is a future applicant uh, in place today. I just can't speak to it hypothetically. So you don't know if there's any future applicants. Do you I have applications not. on hold because you're, 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 this, this pending litigation matter? Not that I'm aware of. Just want to ask you: Is this is is it typical for people to uh, have these applications? Do you get like one a year, ten, twenty, thirty? That's a general question. Um, I don't know the answer to that personally. Can you get us that answer? Yes, we will. I know look you have very that. good. Get you data a, people. A general Appreciate general it. answer on that. Thank you. And can you get us? Oops. Can you get us the, the number of permits that are pending for these mergers? Do you have that information? Um, I don't have it okay. with me, but I can certainly ask if we can get that information. Okay, all right. Um, and then... Uh, general in mergers. Okay, I'm, I'm being asked to uh, ask you, if, if I may, for a clarification. Are you asking specifically for permits that may be pen applications that are pending that involve parts of tax lots in zoning lots? Is that your question? Yes. Thank you. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, and then, if I, I promise this is the final one. When a zoning lot is merged, when does it take effect? When it is recorded in ACRIS or when the building's depart or when the owner p um, pulls up a, a building permit to build on that lot? Um, so, the zoning resolution um, allows for declarations to be filed um, or requires that uh, these documents be filed uh, in the city register. And at the time they're filed, uh, they can in fact constitute a zoning lot. However, development cannot proceed on that zoning lot until they file with DOB. Um, and to the extent that, you know, if there's an issue, certainly we would raise it. But yeah. if there's no issue, that Technically speaking, it could happen at the time of filing on ACRIS. Okay. Well, I want to thank the panel for testifying today. I really appreciate it. And uh, we're going to bring up our next panel. Uh, we're going to start with uh, the Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer.
do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. If you could please identify yourself. Thank you very much. Um, I am Gail Brewer, Manhattan Borough President. I want to thank Chair Cabrera and Chair Salamanca and all the members of the Land Use and Government Operations Committee. These are very special committees to me, so I appreciate being here. Um, and I am simply here to express support for Intro 1701. Um, and I want to thank Council Member Kalos and all the other sponsors. In my office, we have seen developments crop up in residential neighborhoods, as you can imagine, many of which are out of scale heights that destroy the community fabric. And often the question is, how did this building get so large, so big? Leaving aside those developments that use zoning loopholes, which you have discussed and could in fact be an issue for another hearing, the answer is almost always that the developer purchased development rights, also known as air rights, from an adjacent property. The legislation before you has a simple focus. It mandates that the local community board, council member, along with the borough president, and the office of the speaker are informed every time a transaction for the sale of development rights takes place. I think this empowers communities, this law. Too often developers purchase their development rights and their building plans are well underway by the time the community even becomes aware of the development. But when communities get an early sense of what developments are coming to their neighborhood, they have the opportunity to better engage the developers, ask them the right questions, and get them and everyone to understand what the concerns are. In essence, it gives communities an opportunity to shape what the development looks like, and I think it gives uh, positive um, predictability to the owner. In the worst case scenarios, when a community feels it has to mount a challenge against the development, whether it's at the Department of Buildings or the Board of Standards and Appeals, which you heard about earlier, advance notice can be critical. So I have long advocated for community planning and a pre year LERP effort in order to allow communities an opportunity to have an early say in how their neighborhoods grow and build. However, not a lot of that came through in the uh, Charter Revision 2019, despite our best efforts. But I believe this legislation will offer an analogous benefit for as of right developments. I support the legislation. I urge the committee to support it. And I thank the community boards that are considering it. I know Board 12 and Board 8 are here. And the other boards of Manhattan are all taking it up. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I just have one quick question. Can you just briefly explain your pre euler uh, process? Oh, yeah, we tried. I mean, with the uh, larger uh, rezonings, which you are only too familiar with, um, we would have liked to mandate something similar to what maybe you did at Jerome or what we did in East Harlem, which was we had, in that case, two years, a year and a half before the clock started ticking at the City Planning Commission. We did the same thing with South Street Seaport. We obviously did it with East Midtown with Council Member Gorodnik. So instead of having you know, 50, 60 days at every juncture, you have uh, a good time period legally to state we would like to have community input so you have more time and you have a better process. We tried to get that through the Charter 2019. Jim Karras was then our rep. We were not successful, the mayor's office reps did not want it. Interesting, all right. Um, Councilman Kalos, you have a question? Uh, thank you for coming out in support and for thank your you. patience. Uh, folks have, have been critical of Introduction 1701, calling it a, a, a NIMBY bill. Uh, do you feel that it would be NIMBY, or do you th what, what tools would it provide? Well, what I tried to say is that we feel that predictability is important for the owners, and I know that's what they want, but I think at this point, at this juncture in our city, we need to know when buildings, we know so many religious institutions, for instance, um, the owner gets a call of the building, the religious institution could be the, the uh, faith-based leader or the owner of the faith-based building, and they're told, do you want to purchase? Uh, we'll buy your air rights. Nobody in the community has any sense that this is taking place. So I think, it w it's, I don't believe it's NIMBY, I believe it's better planning, and I think obviously as these community boards, elected officials, we've become quite used to trying to figure out how to work as a group, as a committee, as a community. 
but was absolutely blindsided. Particularly, I have to deal with hundreds of applications that appear with the faith-based uh, situations. We lose your building, you have no sense that it's even taking place, all of a sudden you have a new uh, building going up uh, right next door or across the street, wherever the air rights allow you to go. So I think better planning is what I would call it, similar to what the earlier discussion was. How do we plan better for this city? And I think this would be part of it. If there's public notice around the transfer of air rights, do you believe that people in the community, at religious institutions, or even just living in some of the buildings, whether owners or tenants, would make their decisions differently, knowing that it was part of an air rights assemblage versus just a typical transaction? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you're a little bit of a leading question, council member, because I, but I do think that <laughs> I'm, what I'm trying to say, because I know there's owners and there's community, and sometimes there's a difference of opinion, but I do think we all need to plan better together, and this would be an example of how it could happen. We are really getting blindsided by uh, the air rights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very Madam much. President. All right, so uh, we're going to bring up our next panel, uh, and, and my apologies if I uh, mispronounce your name. Uh, we have George Jaynes, uh, Sean Corsandi, Andrea Goldwyn, right, I said that right, okay, uh, Thomas Devan, Devan, Devan Ve, yeah, Sean Devan. Come up, Thomas. And um, Olive Freud. And we're going to ask the Sergeant of Arms to give them two minutes each. Yes, you can, um, you can begin. Yeah, we can start from the right, yes. Okay, I'll go first. Um, uh, my name is George James. I'm an urban, urban planner. I'm here to support um, 1691, 1692, and 1701. Um, I'm, I have prepared testimony. I have a lot of testimony written that I've, I've given to the uh, sergeant at arms to pass around, but I'm gonna uh, actually break from it to respond to some things I heard today. Um, Council Member Reynoso asked if it would be in DCP's interest to have this, and I will answer this definitively. It would absolutely be in, in, in DCP's interest to have this. Um, whenever you do an EIS, I'm going to just pick one. Whenever you do an EIS, you have to do a reasonable worst case development scenario. Um, and, uh, you know, so you have to go through and look at what's going to happen uh, in the area just as of right. And so, for instance, in the Sutton Place rezoning that just happened recently, um, there is a soft site that is in the reasonable worst case development scenario that has a 500 foot building on it. You know, it had sold all of its development rights 50 years previously, but it went through, it was certified by C DCP, went through public review, and, you know, got made into law. And that building was, should not have been in the environmental review. Um, Council Member Cabrera asked how common the parts of tax lots were. They're very uncommon. Um, it doesn't happen very often at all. During the um, 200 Amsterdam uh, BSA hear uh, hearings, uh, the attorneys on both sides did research. And I, as I recall in my head, it was the number was one side came up with nine, the other side came up with 17 um, over the past, since 1977. So fewer than one a year in all cases. Uh, but we have to do this. We have to build the da database of tax lots. And, and I see I'm out of time, but I just wanna show if you have my my um, testimony, the picture, this is the picture of the 200 Amsterdam tax lot. They have a map, I have a, the full size one, and then a, a detail. You can't read the numbers on the map, right? You can't read these numbers. We have to actually start building this database right now because if we don't, we're just gonna end up in a complete administrative nightmare. Thank you for your testimony and for your presentation. Good morning, Chairs, Council Members, Sean Corsandi for Landmark West. Landmark West finds the proposed legislation to daylight the transfer of development rights a welcome change to an unnecessarily opaque procedure, one that too often a neighborhood only learns of when a development creeps far above its surrounding context, months and sometimes years into the construction process. 
By alerting the impacted community within five days, this legislation will bolster transparency and allow communities to make informed decisions on how best to pool, save, and expend their resources, or in other words, triage and plan in the absence of an organized city-led approach to planning and zoning, which results in the haphazard skyline defining our city today. It will also provide opportunity for neighbors to evaluate comparable sales of TDRs when in negotiation with a developer who is hoovering unused rights from any given block, assuring them a level footing for fair negotiations. Further, sharing this information will, take the, will then make individual community boards stewards of the record so they may better be able to trace and track any future movement of sold uh, air rights to make sure they're not realized and resold again elsewhere. Ascribing a simple forward in a nominal expense is a nominal expense of time in a digital age and comes at no cost of postage. There's no hardship imposed by this legislation to any party, but rather a pure benefit to the public. Added breadth to this legislation would impose a penalty for noncompliance, as such there is not one listed. Landmark West supports intro 1701. Uh, good day, Chair Salamanca, Councilmember Kalos. I'm Andrea Goldwyn speaking for the New York Landmarks Conservancy. For nearly five decades, the Conservancy has been dedicated to preserving, revitalizing, and reusing New York's buildings and neighborhoods. The Conservancy supports Intro 1701. This bill will increase transparency in real estate transactions and give fair warning to elected officials and residents when unused development rights are being assembled. For too long, owners have been able to subvert the intentions of the zoning resolution and use loopholes to create out-of-scale, out-of-context towers. The Department of City Planning has started to address the problem of mammoth mechanical voids, but there's more to do. As we've heard time and again today, we've seen absurdly small lots used to evade contextual building requirements. We've seen developers pull together FAR from stray unbuildable lots to create zoning lot polygons that defy planning logic. Intro 1701 won't solve all of these problems, but it's an important step in the right direction. New York will always grow and change, but this process needs to be fair and equitable. We thank the council members who sponsored this bill in conjunction with the Manhattan Borough President, and we thank you for taking this deep dive today and unfortunately encountering some of the frustrations that we've all felt when agencies can't seem to provide the answers we're all looking for. While the administration has been slow to respond, we're glad to see this branch of government take up these issues, and we urge you to vote in favor of this legislation. Thank you. Uh, my name is Olive Brooks. You can just, um, I'm sorry, uh, the microphone. Uh, can you help her there? Yeah, just press the rib. My name is Olive Freud. I'm the president of the Committee for Environmentally Sound Development. We're the ones in litigation over 200 Amsterdam Avenue. Before I read what I have to say, I want to say that uh, up until now, you've been, you've been asking this question, how do we put a, a limit on height? One of the ways, and it's been all, all through history, is that you take the number of stories and you multiply by 10. And then that's the way you get the height, until now, until a few years ago. Uh, thank you so much for looking into the operation of the Board of Standards and Appeals and zoning lot mergers. My organization, the Committee for Rent, is in litigation of it. In contention is whether a zoning lot consists of two or more lots or consists of two or more lots plus parts of additional tax lots. The, the minority report of the BSA, uh, their June report, June 25th, supports our contention that a zoning lot can only consist of two or more tax lots. This has never been a question before because mergers have always been two or more lots. I shouldn't have said never. I think it's seven uh, cases over the years that were not, and this one. The developer of 200 Amsterdam Avenue submitted a brand new interpretation of mergers, which has led to the 39 side zoning lots shown on page two. If you have my uh, thing that I handed out, you could just turn it over and see what happens when you don't do two. Yeah, I see the picture there. Just turn it over. That's it. The little yellow, the little yellow is their lot, and the thing in red is what he managed uh, to fool them into, uh, but he handed in. We cannot allow this as a set of pre precedents, allowing our parks and green areas to be used as parts of mergers. That's going to happen all over the city if we allow this to go on. 
the language has been clear to all developers. That is, there are lots of developments going on in this city that do it the way they should do it. Two, two lots, no parcels. Nobody bothers them and they go ahead and put up their building. Uh, this is an, uh, your opportunity to erase all ambiguity in the zoning regulations. Zoning regulations have to be a factor in determining the heights of buildings. We would also like to make the point that manipulating zoning regulations allows for increased height and bulk. Once you get a bigger height, you get a tremendous bulk. And that's what's happening with these tall buildings and terrible shadows. Uh, to the, it, and it's detrimental to the surrounding community. It's so nobody cares about us. It's only the developer that counts. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thomas Devaney, Senior Director of Land Use and Planning at the Municipal Arts Society. The transfer of development rights is a frequently used, let, yet clandestine, as a right mechanism that has had significant impact on development in New York City. Since 2013, when the Municipal Arts Society released its first accidental skyline report, over 300 million square feet of development rights have been used citywide, the equivalent of nearly double the size of all planned development in Hudson Yards. However, the amount of TDRs used is not known because there's no way of tracking them. Although individual development uh, right transfers are currently recorded at the Department of Finance's ACRIS website, this information can only be assessed, accessed if a user has a reason to look at a specific address or tax lot. There is no way to be notified of a recorded TDR agreement, nor is it possible to find transfers on a map. Therefore, any comprehensive analysis of TDRs is virtually impossible. The timely series of bills being introduced by the council should go a long way towards bringing TDR process into the light. MAS has long advocated for increased transparency, accountability, and availability of public information in the city's as-of-right land use decisions. In our 2017 update of the Accidental Skyline Report, we noted that existing resources are all too often deficient in informing the public of important real estate transactions and land use decisions until the development process has been completed. As noted in our report, the city lacks an online platform that provides clear and comprehensive information about TDRs and zoning lot mergers. Even when information is provided, as it is on the ACRA site, navigation is often an exercise in futility. In Accidental Skyline, MAS pushed for the city to make all information pertaining to zoning lot development agreements and other real estate transactions accessible by notifying the local community boards and elected officials. The bills being introduced today represent a big step forward in, in addressing these deficiencies. That being said, MAS believes that they can be strengthened further. We recommend that the interactive zoning map under intro 1692 should be layered, uh, should be a layer integrated in the city's Zola and Do It map formats, not as a standalone map. Consistent with the recommendations in Accidental Skyline and MAS's recent CEQA report, Tale of Two Rezonings, the city should update CEQA methodology to require the evaluation of an alternative development scenario that factors in potential transfer of development rights in a rezoned area. This would provide a more accurate picture of the of impacts of potential future development under large-scale rezonings. The time is ripe for increased transparency in the TDR process. We commend the Council for the bills being introduced and look forward to more progress on this important issue. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. You have a, sorry, you have a question? Um, all right, can um, just uh, three minutes for Councilman Kalos? I'm sorry, he wants to. Thank you very much for your patience and for uh, being here. <coughs> Do you think that it would be helpful if this legislation also covered not only the transfer of development rights when they're being recorded, but also as the practice appears to be uh, that developers will actually collect options to purchase those development rights? That's what we saw in the filings with Sutton during the bankruptcy. And So DCP wasn't wrong when they said this is going to be hard, right? It's going to be hard. There's no doubt about it. Um, but they still have to do it. When you add in another complexity of options um, that may never be realized, right? Those options can expire and then would never happen. Um, then you've got to constantly update. I, I think, you know, if, I think it would be great if it were there. But I also think it would be just another impediment on something that is already going to be very hard. 
Okay. That's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. So we're going to bring up a next panel. Uh, we have Harry Bubbins, um, Sheila Kendrick, Kendrick, uh, Richard Lewis, and Alita Camp. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak uh, in support of Intro 1701. My name is Harry Bubbins. I'm representing Village Preservation, also known as Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation. We're the largest membership organization in Greenwich Village, the East Village, and NoHo. I'm here today to express my strong support for the bill introduced by Council Member Ben Kalos regarding the community notification requirements for transfer of development rights. We feel this legislation could be incredibly helpful and is unfortunately quite necessary. There's nothing inherently wrong with transferring development rights. However, too frequently, the stacking of development rights for multiple lots is used to facilitate the construction of super tall towers or other structures which are woefully out of scale or character with their surroundings. This, too, is not necessarily illegal or unethical. However, with alarmingly frequency, such projects involve some sort of zoning chicanery and manipulation which should not withstand the scrutiny of the light of day. By giving communities notification of these plans as early as possible in the process, this legislation allows them to give these plans the thorough review that they often do not get from city agencies and pursue challenges when necessary. It's a potentially important tool in the ongoing fight of New Yorkers to protect the character of their neighborhoods and prevent both overdevelopment and the abuse of zoning regulations. Where city agencies like the Department of Buildings, the Department of City Planning, and the Board of Standards and Appeals doing their job and ensuring the plans which bend or break the rules are not allowed to move forward, such a measure might not be necessary. But as Justice Brandeis said, sunlight is the best of disinfectants, and this bill would shine much needed sunlight upon this process. We therefore urge you to uh, approve this bill as soon as possible. Thank you. I'm Sheila Kendrick with Safe Central Park NYC. Um, we work with advocacy groups and city um, advocacy groups citywide as we face challenges that impact Central Park and other precious open spaces. Many are startled when plans are finally realized um, to find that proposed towers are completely contrary to what was expected and out of context with their neighborhoods. This bill, which we support, requiring public notice of TDRs within five days is long overdue. Whether you're an advocacy group, a property owner, a potential buyer, a resident, or a developer, all, all should have access to this information that will, will allow for informed decisions. It will further limit the secret transactions that have been all too frequent in real estate development to date. Numbering tax lots of record and providing interactive maps of, of available air rights will also provide clarity and transparency to all stakeholders. Thank you. Okay. Richard Lewis, I'm board chair of Community Board 12 in Washington Heights and then with the top of Manhattan. We enthusiastically support this in package of, uh, of, leg of legislation, 1691, 1692, and uh, 1701. In fact, the entire board, I would say 40 members supported it unanimously. Uh, so I'm going to keep my statement as briefly as possible. You have it on the record. Uh, uh, and uh, I sat here listening to the testimony of the three agencies, DCP, uh, DOB and uh, BC, uh, the, the BCA. Uh, it was a little bit dis disconcerting to know that they did not know all of the city lots, and there seemed to be great resistance of going backwards uh, and some, some slight enthusiasm going forward. It seems that developers have greater rights of going backwards and putting us in this predicament that we are. This has to change. And I think as an IT professional, I can tell you that it may be problematic to get this information done. It is not impossible. It must be done. The sooner the better. And the sooner we can enforce with more deliberate speed this legislation, it helps the public 
and that's what we like to know. We need to have this information. Thank you very much, and I applaud the council and its members for doing their hard work in getting, uh, getting us to this point. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Do you have any questions? Hi, um, good morning. Thank you, Chair Cabrera, Chair Salamanca, and members of the City Council. My name is Alita Camp. I serve as Chair of Community Board 8 Manhattan. I'm testifying on behalf of 1701, the legislation proposed by Council Member Kalos that would require rapid notification to community boards, council members, the speaker, and the borough president following the sale of development rights. Thank you for hearing my testimony. Buildings change neighborhoods. Buildings built through the transfer of air rights because they are larger, taller, or more expansive change neighborhoods even more. Not only light, air, and sun are affected. These buildings alter communities, including the size and nature of retail, the extent and makeup of affordable housing, and all manner of diversity. Neighborhood preservation is lost. As prices go ever higher to support the prices paid to buy the development rights and the construction costs to build the larger buildings the rights allow, the financials of the neighborhood change. As more affluent residents move in, the restaurants, shop offerings, athletic facilities, community spaces, community groups, and community makeup change. Furthermore, these high-priced buildings attract foreign investment, possibly money laundering. The investors do not live in or contribute to the neighborhood, do not support the local businesses, and are not engaged community members. Physically, though not fully occupied buildings detract from the neighborhood. Communities subject to these changes and often not wanting them should know what is contemplated. We need a head start to evaluate land use proposals. This bill would give us that opportunity. Council members, CB8 urges you to support this bill. It wouldn't give us new rights or greater review. It would give us more knowledge of what others are planning for our communities. What could be wrong with that? I'd also like to remind you of the St. Monica's transfer of 100,000 square feet in development rights to the Extel um, development project on First Avenue between 79th and 80th. The idea was that they would buy air rights from the tenement buildings that are, were along that street and would, some of those buildings would be retained while Extel built its building. Instead, when St. When Monica's bought, sold those 100,000 square feet of air rights, all of the tenements were torn down and now the lot is lying vacant for a year or two or more while Extel develops its plans. So that block is just gone and that piece of community and the affordable housing it might have retained and the small businesses that were in every single building along that street are gone as well. This could help prevent that. Thank, Thank you, you for your testimony. Uh, Councilman Kalos? Yeah. Three minutes for Councilman Kalos. Uh, there have been concerns about NIMBY. Is Would this uh, force boards to be more NIMBY if they received this notice? Uh, or would it, what, what kind of, or how would your two boards use this tool? I don't see what's wrong in evaluating planned proposals. There's something wrong with saying yes to everything, which is the YIMBY approach. NIMBY is saying no to everything. This would give us the tools to look at it and to see whether it makes sense for the community. Right now, developers and uh, Rebney run the show, and it shouldn't be that way. People who live here, people who pay taxes, people who run businesses, small or large, deserve to have a say in their community as well. All this is is giving us information. It gives us no new rights to say no, no new rights to, no new opportunities to put up obstacles, really a chance to, to be able to evaluate and analyze. Archer? Uh, as you know, we do conduct hearings, just like you do, and we'd like to have the information available to us we do, hear, we do hear testimony from the public. We also hear testimony from the developers. If we don't have that in advance, that puts us at a serious disadvantage. So the tools are becoming better and better in zoning, uh, and both visually, uh, as well as other kinds of data. And this, I think, will be very helpful. I don't believe it's gonna create a, a, a NIMBY approach. I think it just helps to avoid a NIMBY approach. Thank you. I would just like to add that growth, economic growth, is not the only thing that matters in the development of a city and the, and the increase in the fabric of the communities. It's also neighborhood preservation, retention of affordable housing, retention of small mom and pop businesses. And so this, again, would just allow us the tools to evaluate, to ask questions, and to, and to help for the community decide what 
really make sense and potentially to work with the developers. No one is saying no to reasonable developments, but the kinds of projects being built at 200 Amsterdam and contemplated on West 66 and 67th Street and Billionaires Row and on the Upper East Side as well are inappropriate and out of context for the communities. And I, I think by way of example, uh, you had a hearing with Extel on 79th Street about what the community needs were. Uh, my office, when Extel bought up uh, 3rd Avenue between 94th and 95th Street, I was actually able to approach the developer and say, we need a school and we're not going to give you anything for it. And they said, okay, we'll put up an Ezra Wright building. We paid cash, market value to build, uh, I believe, 90 pre-K seats that we desperately needed. Uh, they've now built a second school and we're now we're working on hopefully building a third school. So. I think that is an opportunity where folks can actually come to the table, work with the developer, and having the knowledge of those uh, zoning lot transfers and mergers is incredibly helpful. Uh, and then just to the other two, to uh, uh, Save Central Park and to Village Preservation, uh, what are your thoughts on Fernando Cabrera's bills relating to actually being able to see the zoning lot mergers on a map? Uh, I think elementary information is always good, and uh, I'm a consistent user of Zola myself, uh, and the open data is a uh, less clear data set, at least for me, to navigate. And so to the degree that information that exists is shared uh, moving forward, especially as was mentioned today, uh, it seems easy and doable. All right. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. So we're going to call up the last uh, panel. We have uh, Stacy Schaub, Jeffrey Elkin, and uh, Ray Rogers. <laughs> I feel like I'm being arrested. <laughs> So. Well, would you go first? Sure. <laughs> when do I go? All right, you may begin. Thank you. Uh, Stacy Shu from the Seaport Preservation. We at the historic South 3 Seaport enthusiastically support anything that will encourage transparency and inform us of these transfers of building rights and changes to owners' ability to build as of right earlier in the process. By the time we, the stakeholders, find out at the last minute, we feel like we're playing a never-ending game of whack-a-mole. We've limited time and resources to be fighting to protect our neighborhoods from out-of-scale, super-tall skyscrapers that not only eternally change the face of our skyline, but steal our light, cast shadows on the last fortunate, overwhelm our infrastructure and schools, and contrary to what some may believe, do nothing to create affordable housing. Quite the contrary, any arguably affordable housing included in these structures are quickly offset by displacement of long-term residents and skyrocketing rents in the surrounding area. An example of this type of surprise in my neighborhood is 80 South Street. Even today, two years later, most stakeholders have absolutely no idea that because of transference of air rights from Howard Hughes Corp to a Chinese company that purchased this assemblage, they can now build, as of right, a super tall that will be taller than the World Trade Center. Let that sink in. 120-foot tower without any notification and no stakeholder input. We would only be involved if they want to trade neighborhood needs for an even larger structure. That will fit in nicely with the leaning tower of South Street, the off-tilter building nearby under construction that's leaning three inches to the north. Almost all of the 40, 50, and 60-plus story structures erected on the very narrow Fulton Street between Water and Broadway have been a surprise to our neighborhood as we watch four-story buildings being swallowed up and air rights bought and sold under our noses. I fear we may be setting up for yet another fight within our protected historic district if, as expected, Howard Hughes Corp. will reveal their plans tonight for a pencil tower at 250 Water Street this evening. I'd hope that the Extel Tower nearby, the hated, half-empty behemoth looming over the Two Bridges neighborhood, would have served as a warning. Nobody can honestly look at that 80-story building and say it fits within the intention spirit of the original zoning. We support anything that would help to prevent these types of surprises in the future. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Ray Rogers. I represent my organization, Corporate Campaign. The importance of passing Intro 1701 introduced by Council Member Ben Kalis in 1691 and 1692 is to help prevent those real estate tycoons, often referred to as billionaire bullies and racketeers who run Rebney, the real estate board of New York, from continuing to run roughshod over New Yorkers. For those of you who don't know who some of the most influential leaders in Rebney are, let me name a few. Rebney's current chair, Bill Rudin, turned St. Vincent's Hospital into a billion-dollar luxury condo complex. Former Rebney chair Rob Spire of Tishman Spire illegally deregulated thousands of rent-stabilized apartments in Stavison Town and Peter Cooper Village in a scheme to steal millions of dollars from more than 27,000 tenants and to turn apartments into high-priced condominiums. Tax cheat Stephen Ross of related companies worth $7.6 billion thinks New York City construction workers at Hudson Yards are pampered and overpaid. Slumlord Daniel Brodsky and ex Gary Barnett, who created the outlawed poor door entrances and is fueling hypergentrification by populating the city with super tall luxury high rises that block the sunlight and cast a shadow over gardens, parks, and communities like Chinatown. Political leaders not in the pocket of Rebney must fight to pass legislation like that being discussed today and like the Small Business Job Survival Act, which continues to languish before the City Council while small businesses remain in crisis. With proper legislation and proper enforcement, we can, we can, and we must prevent Rebney from further turning New York City into Rebneyville, a place known for slumlords, homelessness, mass evictions and displacement, empty storefronts, dilapidated public housing, warehouse buildings, bulldozed neighborhoods, ridiculous super tall luxury skyscrapers, lack of affordable housing, union bashing, cor corporate criminality, construction worker fatalities, massive corporate welfare, and political corporation. Let's remember what Martin Luther King remind us of. Martin Luther King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So I wholeheartedly support the legislation we're talking about today to bring greater justice to all the residents of New York City. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your, uh, your testimony. Councilman Michaelos? No questions? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the public that would like to testify that did not fill out a form with the Sergeant of Arms? We're going to take a, a two-minute two minute recess.
right, so we're back. In, we're back. Just want to recognize that we've also been joined by Councilman Mark Traeger. And with that, I would like to thank uh, all staff and, and the public and, and the council for today's hearing. This hearing is hereby adjourned.